Hi, everybody, and welcome. This is the Apostate Prophet. I hope you're having a fantastic day. Today, I'm here with a very special program, something that I have uh, planned in advance, something that is very necessary. I have decided to sit down with an expert, a scholar on the Bible. I'm talking today to Dr. Joshua Bowen. Hi, Dr. Bowen. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. Thank you so much. But before we get into finding out more about what we want to talk about today, I'm very interested in your uh, background and your expertise and education. If you could enlighten us on that. Sure. Uh, so I, uh, I, I got a bachelor's in religion. Um, I graduated in uh, 2003, I think, and I went into a uh, 126 semester hour master's program, which anybody that has a master's degree knows that's oddly large, an oddly large number of uh, semester hours for a, a master's degree. But that was in Old Testament studies in the Hebrew Bible. So I, I wrote my uh, master's thesis on the meaning of the divine name El Shaddai. Uh, and I, I taught Hebrew for two years while I was there. And then uh, went to Johns Hopkins University where I got a master's degree in ancient Near Eastern studies and then went on for my PhD there uh, in Assyriology, which is the study of ancient Mesopotamia, languages and cultures of ancient Iraq, and uh, minored also uh, in Hebrew Bible because of my background in, uh, in Hebrew Bible and Old Testament studies. So that's my, that's my background. I got a Fulbright scholarship in 2014 to go to Germany uh, and work on Assyriology out there. I also won another scholarship called the Day Ah Day, which is a German scholarship. But uh, yeah, so I, I've been doing this for a little while, I guess, and uh, know know a little bit about it <laughs> here and here and there. Feels like yeah. Yeah, to put it very very mildly, right? So I feel I feel very humbled right now by uh, don't, don't. the the weight of your <laughs> of I your education that. and all that. <laughs> uh, I can't imagine myself uh, ever at this point on wars acquiring that much uh, <laughs> education and authority in these very interesting fields but i'm very it happy takes to have a, you. it takes a very special kind of psychosis i think to do <laughs> <laughs> just kidding but <laughs> well, you I'm seem kidding. to have taken it very well yeah <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for that introduction so I basically talked to you a little bit about this whole uh, issue that I want to address today. I want to talk about certain biblical locations, locations that are brought up related to uh, the Psalms, a very, a very specific Psalm, Psalm 84, and uh, also specific locations that are mentioned throughout the Hebrew Bible in general. I want to discuss these things with you because certain apologists, uh, Islamic apologists uh, nowadays uh, have this revisionist approach where they try to reinterpret those locations and make it look like those locations could be connected to the Islamic narrative, to the Islamic uh, history, which they think is uh, true and real. I want to start first off by going very briefly, if you want to touch upon that, into what we know about locations in the Bible. It mentions a lot of locations, some of them very significant, some of them less significant. In general, what can we uh, say regarding the specific locations of certain sites that are mentioned in the Bible? Yeah, it's it's complex, right? So, um, you know, I, I, I wrote a book recently where I have a chapter on archaeology and just how archaeology developed. Now, I'm not an archaeologist, you know, by, by profession. Uh, I have a lot of archaeological training. But to get into those types of matters in great detail, you know, uh, we'd want to talk to somebody like William Deaver or Israel Finkelstein or, you know, any number of, um, you know, archaeologists of, of Syria, Palestine. But, you know, the study of the Hebrew Bible starting in, you know, over over 100 years ago, 150 years ago, um, even even earlier, was very much focused. Archaeology is very much focused on what does the Bible say? What does the Hebrew Bible say when we when we open up our Old Testament and it says, you know, Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho, you know, and it says that Jericho should be here, then that's where we're going to go dig, right? And that was the idea. They they always said they had the Bible in one hand and the spade in the other, and that's how they excavated. And it became clear over time, you know, it it didn't always work out quite that way. It wasn't so much that the sites weren't where they were supposed to be. That was often quite quite accurate, you know. 
um, is that when they were supposed to be destroyed or when they were supposed to have been inhabited, those are the things that are, you know, difficult uh, to reconcile with, with the Old Testament, with the Hebrew Bible. So um, Jericho, like we know where Jericho is. We know where the city of Ai is. You know, we uh, there are lots and lots of cities that when the Bible says, you know, X happened at this city and it, it gives, an you know, sort of a location of where that would be. That it actually does work out that way. That's that's where that city is. Uh, it's just that the chronology doesn't very often doesn't match up. So a lot of work has been done in uh, you know even in recent years on the sites that are involved in the Exodus traditions in uh, the Book of Exodus and of course in Numbers as well. The Book of Numbers. Um, as well as the wilderness wanderings, you know, when the Israelites were supposed to have wandered around for 40 years, they didn't really wander all that much, but, you know, uh, they, they were sort of in, in one general area. Uh, but then, you know, the sites where they were supposed to come in, in Transjordan, and then conquer the land across the Jordan River. And those sites, again, lots of work has been done. We, we you know, archaeologists have identified a good, good many of them. And I think with pretty reasonable certainty, certainly cities like Jericho and I and, uh, you know, Kadesh Barnea, uh, of course, several that are, you know, on the on the way out of Egypt have been identified. And so uh, there's some debate about is, you know, is is this the site or is this one that's close by at the site? But th they've identified with reasonable certainty many, many of these sites. Some of the locations that you mentioned already, like Kadesh Barnea, are very uh, relevant to the topic that we want to explore today. I want to go into um, one of the main topics that I uh, informed you about before that I would humbly ask your opinion about, which is uh, the Valley of Abaca, as it mm. uh, reads in our Latin text of the Bible, specifically in uh, Psalms 84. Um, what do we know about the Valley of Baca and where this valley is supposed to be located? So to answer that, I think it probably would be good to take a, a, a small step back mm -hmm. and talk a little bit about Psalm 84 and maybe the Psalms in general. Um, so a lot of work was done early on and continues to be done on how the Psalms were used right, as these sort of short little units, uh, and we don't have to go into any great detail about this, but the Psalms tend to be able to be grouped into uh, different categories. So there are Psalms of praise, there are Psalms of, uh, you know, prayer or, you know, penitentiary Psalms, there are Psalms that are imprecatory Psalms, you know, the one that always gets uh, sort of touted out as Psalm 137, you know, where it's praying for the enemies to have the I probably shouldn't mention that, but you know, not great things to happen to the babies, uh, babies of the enemies. But these are types of psalms that, when you read them, you you kind of, in many cases, can quickly sort of say, okay, well, that's that's this type of psalm, or it's this type of psalm. Well, there's a type of psalm that has been uh, variously like known as the Song of the Ascents or the Psalm of Psalms of Pilgrimage, and basically what these are is. Uh, they're, they're, they're psalms about the journey to Jerusalem. You know, at probably at most once a year, you know, the, the people might be able to afford or be able to go up to Jerusalem uh, for the annual feasts, uh, particularly those that live far away. And of course, it's a journey, right? It's, it's, a, it's a pilgrimage to get there. Um, it's quite a trek. And there are lots of valleys uh, and, and hills that one has to traverse. And then, of course, when you're actually going up to Jerusalem, to Mount Zion, you know, you're, uh, you're, you're going uphill. And so they refer to those as the Psalms of the Ascents because you're ascending. Uh, and that's, that's where those sort of pilgrimage ascent Psalms come from. Well, Psalm 84 is one of these. You know, the Psalm talks about that, that journey. And there are some difficult, uh, difficult parts to the Psalm lexico, you know, as far as lexicography is concerned. And, trying to nail down exactly uh, from textual criticism what's actually there. Uh, but, you know, it's pretty clear from the layout of the psalm that this is this is the, the, the group the, you know, of worshipers, worshipers that are going up to Jerusalem. Uh, this is like a 
a song that they're singing, a psalm that they're singing on their way there. So it's a pilgrimage psalm. That leads into this line about as they travel through the valley of Baha. You know, scholars take different approaches to this. There are basically two main views on what the word there means. The reason that it's unclear is we're not exactly sure what the form of the word is. So as it stands in like the main Masoretic text tradition, you have this word Baha with an Aleph at the end. And the Aleph, you know, Beit Kaf, Aleph has, you know, is, is variously translated like balsam trees to a certain type of tree that has uh, like produces gum. And I'm not an expert on, um, you know, trees or anything like that. But um, if it's spelled that way with the Aleph, then it takes on sort of that meaning. So then it's sort of like, OK, well, these types of trees tend to grow in dry areas or you know, sandy areas, more arid ar areas, and that would fit with the psalm because it's like as the worshipers are making their pilgrimage through this dry area where these balsam trees are, that springs are, you know, coming up. And so th it's like they're bringing the joy with them and enlivening the land. That's one, you know, way that that's been interpreted. Many of the translations the versions of the Hebrew Bible, like the Greek Septuagint or the Latin Vulgate or the Syriac Peshitta, they are rendering it from a different root, a different Semitic root. And instead of rendering it from Beit Kaf Aleph, they take it from Beit Kaf He. And uh, Baha there, you know, as a verb, means to weep or to cry. So in Hebrew, if I say Ani Boche, uh, it's like I am crying, I am weeping. And so then, you know, there are different ways that you can go with that. If you see this as weeping, then you can take it uh, more metaphorically. The word amic, so the, the valley, the amic uh, baha, you know, could be an actual like a valley, right? But it also has this more metaphorical or poetic meaning of like deep. So when you couple deep with sorrow or weeping, then you have like very deep sorrow. If you don't take the word Baha to be like a proper noun, the actual name of a particular valley, I think that's probably where there's some confusion in the in the versions. There's actually something related there. I'm sorry for for sure, interrupting no, there, but uh, that the that the text says uh, Ha Baha, which yeah. uh, which some say should be referring to it as a noun and as a proper noun, probably. So if you look up uh, the way the proper nouns are used, quite often there is no, that that word, uh, that form ha on the front is uh, like al in Arabic, the definite article. Oftentimes proper nouns don't receive the definite article. So like, I, you know, I wouldn't say um, Beit ha Yosef, I would say Beit Yosef. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the fact that Joseph, the house of Joseph. It's a, it's a proper noun that often doesn't, you know, require the definite article because it's it's definite in and of itself. It's a particular person in and of itself. But uh, you also do have certain toponyms, certain proper nouns that are you know, geographic areas or cities or places that do contain the definite article. So it doesn't surprise me. And 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 there are people that do take this as uh, like a, a definite place like a definite valley it's just we don't know where it would be specifically and we have we have certain um as far as i understand it we have certain uh valleys uh throughout the bible that are often uh not mentioned to refer to a specific place of great importance but that are mentioned simply as uh in poetic form as part of the narrative this yeah. is not unique to that specific psalm as i see it right sure yeah like something like psalm 23 for example, it's just what I'm pulling off the top of my head. Uh, you know, it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you know, is this a particular valley? Probably not. This is probably just poetic, you know, expression of some very, you know, shadowy, deep uh, emotional state that the person is in or dangerous situation that the person is in or whatever. And I haven't read all the secondary literature on Psalm 23. So, you know, uh, maybe there are people that do think that that's a particular valley, but the name, like this is the valley of the shadow of death over here. And this is the, this one over here is the valley of the 
you know, non shadow of life. I don't know, what I, but um, I don't think it probably doesn't work that way. It's probably poetic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Psalm 84, we are talking about uh, going to Zion, going to you know, a place called Zion, and it very uh, clearly talks about a longing for this place and going to this place for pilgrimage purposes. So we would imagine that this valley of Baha, whether it refers to an actual place or whether it is metaphorical, would then refer to something in this surrounding of Zion. Yeah. There is one matter, which is certain apologists that I have had discussions with have brought up this idea that uh, Zion in this psalm does not refer to uh, Jerusalem or does not refer to Mount Zion or the the heart of you know the temple or the the city or Israel in general, but it it could mean something else. Like it could be referring to a different place of worship, like uh, Mecca, for example. But um, I mean, I would I pointed out that this that I'm not at all familiar with this. And when I research further into this, I don't see that uh, Zion is used for different places traditionally, since uh, Zion is in reference to a specific mount and to a specific location, which then becomes a synonym of Jerusalem and of Israel in general. Is that a reasonable suggestion that the Zion in this psalm could be referring to something else instead of Jerusalem? I mean, there's no doubt, and I haven't, you know, I haven't dug deep or anything uh, into all the different usages of Zion. So that might be something interesting to look at in more detail, but certainly it almost exclusively, it refers to parts of uh, Jerusalem, right? There is a broader notion or like a broader usage where it can refer to like all of Judah in the South, uh, the specific context without looking, I suspect that, you know, those will, will fall in line with people that are outside of the land and they're saying, let's go up to Zion, that uh, maybe it, it carries this idea of all of, you know, the southern portion of, uh, of Palestine. But, it, but again, it all sort of focuses in on Jerusalem. I don't know of any usage uh, that would indicate it's something, something outside of uh, relationship with, with Jerusalem or with Judah. And it would be inconsistent, right? Because when we look at uh, the Psalms around it, related Psalms, Psalms in the same category, Psalms that are also attributed to the uh, sons of Korah, for example, we see Zion so much in these uh, Psalms and sure. they, uh, looking at the context, very clearly refer to uh, Mount Zion or to Israel, to Jerusalem. So it would, yeah, be very sure. it would be very strange that this would refer to something completely different. Sure. Yeah. In this Psalm, absolutely. Like I, I'm, I'm trying Trying to think are there any usages ever of Zion that might be, a, but certainly here in this Song of the Ascent or the, the Pilgrimage Psalm, I mean, this is very, very explicitly uh, referring to Jerusalem, and this is where they're going for their holy feast. Like that's it's it's, it's that's what the Psalm is talking about. Uh -huh. So, you know, I mean, this 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 is what it, it re certainly what it refers to in Psalm eighty four, in my opinion. But again, it's sort of an it's, it's part of the trek, right? It's part of the journey. Most scholars uh, that that I looked at would take this more metaphorically. Most understand this to be sort of a metaphorical uh, dry area that is becoming lush or becoming green um, as they as they bring their joy in the in this uh, ascent up to, to Mount Zion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to talk with you about one specific issue that is related to all of this, which is uh, the wilderness of Paran or the desert of Paran. Mm -hmm. And the claim is that the desert or the wilderness of Paran uh, is probably the western coast, the Hejaz region, which would then also include Mecca, which is why certain biblical, uh, you know, mentions of the desert of Paran could be references to Mecca. And this, as I see it, conflicts entirely with what uh, the general biblical consensus is about where Paran is located. Yeah. To your knowledge, what can we say about the location of Paran? So there, there are a couple different passages in the Hebrew Bible that um, give pretty clear indications uh, about where the wilderness of Paran is. One is Numbers chapter 13. And in Numbers chapter 13, this is, you know, talking about the time when the children of Israel have sort of encamped along the southern border uh, of, of Canaan, and they're getting ready to send in spies 
to spy out the land. And uh, if you look at Numbers 13, it talks about uh, that they get sent out from the, you know, the wilderness of Paran in the south, and they go up into the land and they spy it all out, and then, and then they return back uh, to the wilderness of Paran, and it says specifically that they go back, I think it's in verse 26, if I'm remembering that correctly, it says, um, and they went back to Kadesh, Kadesh Barnea, uh, which is in the wilderness of Paran. Um, and this fits quite well, right? The idea that the Israelites are, you know, along the southern border and going in, it, it's it's indicating that it's, if you knew nothing else about it, that they're right on the border of Canaan. And and if you think about where they've come from, uh, if you get a, you know, like a map in your mind of of Egypt and the Mediterranean, they've come from Egypt, you know, they, uh, they're, they're around the southern portion, south of Israel, and then they come up on the southern border. So in between Egypt, it's got to be somewhere in between Egypt and southern portion of Canaan down by the negative, uh, which fits. And of course, this fits also. There's another passage in First Kings where Solomon, I believe, is the one that goes and fights against uh, Hadad and, and Edom. And when Hadad leaves, he's just a boy and he flees from Edom, which is, you know, like down in the south. Uh, south of the Dead Sea and flees from there, goes through the area of Midian, which is like southern Transjordan, and goes through the wilderness of Paran to Egypt. So, I mean, that like the, the path is very clear. He's going slightly south and west and he's, he's, he's coming down into Egypt. So that all sort of locates this area, the wilderness of Paran, in that area. Uh, and then more specifically, when we learn that Kadesh Barnea is in the larger area that's called the wilderness of Paran, we know where Kadesh Barnea is, right? Uh, and uh, like we know which site that is, Kuderet. And um, so, yeah, I mean, this is all stuff that's uh, south of like the, of the Negev, uh, and in between Sinai, like the Sinai Peninsula and Egypt, right? It's it's all sort of in that in that area. Hopefully that made sense. Yeah, no, it does. It does. Uh, the Bible mentions several wildernesses and deserts. So uh, even if it is in the Sinai Peninsula, that would make it a separate wilderness or a separate desert within the peninsula. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't mean that there is only one desert or only one wilderness in the Sinai Peninsula, right? Yeah, and I mean, I think it's. I think it's really important to recognize that following this, you know, return of the spies, uh, that the Israelites are then sort of doomed to wander around for that generation. And where they wander, quote unquote, is essentially Kadesh Barnea, right? So this is an important area that they're that they're wandering in. And I think 38 years they spend in Kadesh Barnea or around it. So, you know, it's a significant area. And again, it's in between. Uh, it's much easier to picture this, I think, if you have a map. Maybe it can be thrown up on the screen at some point. I but <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's important to recognize that the path that is being taken whether you're coming out of Edomite territory or you're coming out of Canaan proper, it's down to the south, to the west, and it's in between Canaan and Egypt. That's that's where it's depicted in the biblical text. It seems very unlikely to me when I look at the narrative of the Bible in general and how it describes uh, places and sites that uh, something like the desert of Paran or the wilderness of Paran, even if we didn't have, you know, the whole context and all the uh, connected dependent locations, some of which are very obvious to us, even if we didn't have any further information, it seems very unlikely to me that the desert of Paran could be referring to a vast, a very large region like the the entire uh, Hejaz region or the entire, you know, western coast of Arabia, right? I mean, this is very, this would be very uncommon as far as I see it from my readings. Yeah, I mean, there seems to be a fair amount of specificity when you look at these passages. It, it's, it seems to be that, sure, you know, Kadesh Barnea is the city and then, you know, the, the larger area in which Kadesh Barnea is, is the wilderness uh, of Paran. But if you just think about the area in between above Sinai and to the east of Egypt and to the west of Midian. I mean, it's big on a map, I guess, you know, depending on what you're talking about. But I mean, it's, it's very much a localized region. And I think that if you're trying to make it into an area that's larger, it sort of bucks against 
it makes the journey odd <laughs> for somebody like Haddad coming out and then going somewhere else and then coming back up and going to Egypt doesn't it doesn't seem like that's what they're intimating in the text if that makes sense yeah I'm absolutely that's very helpful I like all the information that we are getting I just want to ask you a few questions a series of questions um, and you may or may not answer them depending on um, you know whether you want to go into those or you know whether I know these are things that you have uh, specifically dealt with or whether you want to give an opinion on these things uh, in your opinion or to your knowledge or just going by reason, do you think there is any possibility that uh, the Israelites throughout their history, which is uh, you know somewhat recorded by the Bible, had any big uh, relations with a place that is very far south, like Mecca, for example, as we know it today? Did you ever know of such a thing or hear of such a thing? Yeah, I've nothing is coming to mind. Um, and Mecca's pretty far, pretty far south. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not that I not that I know of, but I certainly I haven't looked into, uh, you know, like, uh, trade relations or anything like that. If I mean, if, if that if if that level of relationship would be relevant, mm -hmm. that wouldn't surprise me in any way that there's trade relations. Uh, I mean, you know, you have to think, uh, the two major highways, the Way of the Sea and the King's Highway, run through Israel. So, I mean, you know, if, if you're doing anything uh, down to the south or if you're you're doing anything up to the north and to, you know, Anatolia and uh, uh, Mesopotamia or further east, you know, chances are it's going to come through Palestine. So it wouldn't surprise me if there are trade relationships uh, but I don't, I don't know of any mention in the biblical text. That's none that stand out to me. That probably didn't help at all. But <laughs> it absolutely did actually, because I mean, even the lack of knowledge of such a thing, just uh, you know, <laughs> points more towards the idea that you know there's probably not really much to it. But of course, this is a discussion that we can um, probably go into at some different point uh, if you if you would like to. Um, one one other question that I have is the assertion that Abraham might have gone down to Mecca to build a temple there. I mean, as far as I see it, we have uh, the accounts of uh, the story of Abraham because it is so fundamental and so significant to the Hebrew Bible. We have them all very much laid out and yeah. there are maps made about these things. Is it conceivable to you that he would have uh, gone down there to Mecca to build a very significant temple? There's certainly nothing in the text of the Hebrew Bible that would lead me to believe that would have happened. Uh, you know, Genesis is pretty, pretty clear uh -huh. in the stories that it tells, uh, you know, about where he was and what he was doing. So, you know, coming from more of the Chaldees, not that I would say, just to be clear, not that I would say that that's necessarily historically accurate, because I don't think that it is. But, um, you know, the way that the narrative portrays it, he's coming from the east coming into Canaan, wandering through Canaan's, you know, building tents, uh, you know, and altars and all these things. Uh, he goes down south a couple of times, uh, but then comes back up. You know, the stories, I think, are pretty, the, the Abrahamic cycle, I think, is relatively clear. And I don't see anything in there that would lead me to believe that he, that he exited Canaan uh, to any great distance. I mean, it seems implausible to me anyway that he would, um, I mean, the, the narrative would be the uh, Islamic narrative, or the narrative that, uh, most, that, that Muslim apologists would suggest, is that uh, Abraham, under the um, you know the the authority, the command of uh, Allah or God, uh, went to went down there to Mecca to build the first house dedicated to God there in Mecca. I mean, it seems implausible to me that such a highly important thing would have no mention at all in biblical scripture, and it would also seem implausible to me me that after doing that uh, he would just again go you know up there to the to, to the to the regions now known as Israel and to just pursue the rest of his life there it's... yeah I mean would it I, I trying to be play devil's advocate I mean is there is there some thought 
that maybe, and I don't, I don't see any evidence of this, but is, does the argument go on that front that this would have been revisionistic history, that it actually would have been in the original, you know, stories, uh, and that this was, you know, either either taken out or re-edited so that it would look, is that is that the idea? Yeah, it depends on who we're talking to, but the general assertion is, is okay. made, and then there are certain different uh, methods to explain the inconsistency, the discrepancy between the uh, the Islamic accounts and the, 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 the Jewish or the Hebrew accounts of this issue. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know how, I'm trying to, to be fair, uh, to, in, in my thoughts here, um, that doesn't seem plausible to me. Um, because I think we know a fair amount about the editorial history uh, of the Hebrew Bible, particularly the Pentateuch, particularly that section of the Pentateuch. And there's nothing that I can think of that would lead me to believe that that editorial history would have resulted in taking out something that monumental that was there. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that the writers would have spun it, perhaps, in a way that would have been beneficial, to deleting it completely. That seems difficult. That seems implausible. But uh, those, those are just my thoughts. Somebody like um, uh, Joel Baden up at Yale would that be a good, a really good question for him because he works obviously specifically in uh, the editorial history of the Pentateuch. But um, yeah, but I don't, I don't see any reason to suspect that that's the case. Yeah, and I, I don't want to put uh, too much on you here. I know it's, I'm just trying to get out information from you. From sure, sure, you, yeah. You, you know, so far, I will be very honest with you about what I don't know. So <laughs> that much you can, <laughs> that much you can, uh, you can count on. That's very much appreciated. Well, I, I love having you here, and I want to have you on here again. One last question. You don't have to answer it as said. One final question is: um, as a scholar. Uh, a student, a scholar, an expert on various fields that deal with uh, biblical history with the Near East. Have you heard of the Kaaba as a place of significance in the larger ancient history of these regions and the mythologies and traditions and religions? Is this something that to you, in your understanding and in your entire scholarship, is, of, is something that is of significance? Nothing comes to mind as far as the textual data is concerned. Mm -hmm. You know, from an archaeological standpoint, I still don't know of anything, but, you know, that would be a, perhaps another area to explore. But, but again, I, don't, I have some background, a fair amount of background in archaeological, um, you know, matters archaeological. Uh, Anthropology, you know, I don't, I don't really have a lot of background in the anthropology, so you know, maybe that would be another way to come at this. But nothing, nothing that I know of uh, in my investigations would, off the top of my head here, would suggest that area being of importance to uh, individual worshippers or those those that are in Palestine worshiping. Nothing that I know of, or of it being a place of importance just in the in the broader ancient Near East. Nothing that I know of. Mm -hmm. This is already very enlightening. I mean, uh, you might not see it as such, but uh, I mean, getting these responses just uh, confirms what I, you know, very, very much uh, know and very much expect. You know, the lack of information, the lack of knowledge about these things, very much confirms the idea that uh, you know there is probably not much significance to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And um, but that this is definitely something that I would uh, that I think can be explored and i would definitely be interested in uh you know reaching out to you and getting your help again in various matters in in these fields sure i think our uh, our analysis our research my quest for information from a scholar like yourself on these matters is very much uh, complete here at this point but as said i would love to have you back again I, I hugely enjoyed this and i think this is extremely beneficial well i'm glad i'm glad that i could help uh, i appreciate it so much is there anything else that you want to uh, add to anything that we have talked about you know we've talked a little bit about archaeology and i know it's a terrible terrible self-promotion but if you're interested in like a basic uh introduction to what archaeology is and how it works and how biblical archaeology works and how it's developed and also uh 
you know, just the story of the Bible. We've talked a lot about Abraham. And if you're interested in what the narrative of the Hebrew Bible actually is just saying, you know, what the story is, the book that I uh, published recently, the Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament, has an entire chapter dedicated to the story of the Old Testament and an entire chapter dedicated to archaeology and how it works. There are other things in it, obviously, but those are the two things that we've talked about that I think are, are covered and could be useful to the listener if if they're interested in that. When I heard, when I heard of you and when I uh, decided to get in touch with you, I actually um, purchased your book and I am studying it right now and going through it. It's very interesting. It's a very different perspective. I hugely appreciate it. So I would uh, definitely uh, encourage everybody who is interested in these subjects to also consider it and to also get a copy of that book, uh, read it, listen to it. It's very interesting. What I definitely forgot to plug here at the very beginning, at least we shouldn't forget it at the end. Uh, Dr. Joshua Bowen also has his own uh, has his own work on a dedicated YouTube channel, which is known as uh, Digital Hammurabi, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, my wife runs it primarily. I I contribute to it, uh, but yeah, it's it's all about the ancient Near East and the Hebrew Bible. It's uh, you know trying to trying to bring those things to what do we say interested non-specialists that's what we say We're trying to make the ancient Near East sort of come to life including the hebrew bible so and we've got um we've got everything there from you know videos about what life was like in the ancient Near East to we have a video series on how to learn sumerian if you're interested in learning sumerian or we have a series on how to learn biblical hebrew and all that stuff's free on there so you know that actually stuck out to me. I saw that you have a very popular video on how to learn or how to speak or how to read Sumerian. We actually wrote, because it was so popular, we put a little book, out, a, a book out about it, how to learn ancient Sumerian. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's pretty popular. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, that's awesome. I mean, that, that is such an interesting thing. It's not something that you just yeah. encounter and find everywhere. This is uh, very special, really. Yeah, but it's great. I mean, the, the, the thing that I love, and I'll be quiet about it, but the thing I love about Sumerian, the language, the languages and cultures of ancient Iraq, I mean, if you understand Sumerian, it's like you understand where, I, I don't want to be over dramatic, but like where we came from, right? I mean, you know, writing is first invented in Mesopotamia, right? It's invented in Iraq. And Oh, I think the world owes a great debt of, grat debt of gratitude to, uh, to, you know, to ancient Mesopotamia and to people that have carried on those traditions. So, um, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm excited that we can sort of be a part of that and help people kind of get back to the roots, you know, get back to uh, where Western civilization really was born. So uh, yeah, I'm excited about that. When I research uh, matters related to my former religion, which I mainly focus on, which is Islam, I also find a lot of, uh, you know, patterns, a lot of things that it has in common with uh, ancient traditions, a lot of things that lead back to, as it seems to me, Sumerian uh, culture and Sumerian yeah. beliefs. Right? So yeah. it can teach us so much, as I see it, about uh, the religions, the traditions, the mythological ideas that we hold. Yeah, and I'm actually. Uh, I'm actually teaching through the book uh, live on Sunday evenings at, uh, I think it's at 7.30 Eastern Standard on a channel called um, The Atheist Network Group, T-A-N-G, I think is how they do it for short. I have a student there that uh, runs the channel that is learning Sumerian live. So if, if you are interested in seeing how the, the language goes together, it's a, it's a great, great channel to go to. This is very interesting to me. I will probably uh, make a short clip of this as well. I mean, it's not it's it's not as uninteresting to me and to the channel as you as you want to think it is. But <laughs> it's, I appreciate I, that. I thank you so much, Doctor Joshua Bowen. Everybody. Um, I wasn't great enough at plugging it here, but as said, uh, Dr. Joshua Bone is a great expert on uh, various extremely interesting fields and various extremely uh, you know, related fields to everything that uh, I am doing and that people are interested in who are on this channel. So um, you can purchase his uh, books, you can buy his recent book and uh, read it. It is very interesting. Uh, you can go over and visit his uh, YouTube channel, Digital Hammurabi. You can uh, subscribe to that. Please go ahead and subscribe to that. that is hugely interesting something that the world i think needs more of i am very happy to have you here today uh dr bowen and i as said many times before i will be glad and happy to have you back again i appreciate it thank you very much thank you so much everybody have a fantastic day and i will see you again